Good morning, Pastor Jerry here from Calvary Baptist Fellowship, Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. If you'd like to visit us, we're at 915 Egg Harbor Road, right across the street from Dairy Queen, and everybody's a welcome guest. Service times are 10 o'clock Sunday morning, 5 o'clock Sunday evening, and we'd be honored to have you. Take your Bibles this morning, turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, we're reading verses 1 through 7. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. Verse 1, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars, and has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake, uh, has labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have uh, somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto the, thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of thy place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Father, we thank you so much for your loving kindness. Thank you for Jesus Christ that hung on the cruel cross and died for our sins in our place. And we sure do thank you for that. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for calling us, Christ for dying for us, and then the Holy Spirit for convincing us of a need of a Savior and reminding us that we're all sinners, reminding us that uh, that we are not righteous, that only God is righteous, and that also that there's a judgment or a penalty to pay for our sins. I pray that you guide today. Help me as I uh, go over to the church a little bit here. We'll just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. As we approach Revelation chapters 2 and 3, we find uh, uh, letters from Christ to the seven churches as outlined in Revelation chapter 1, verse 11. Turn back with me there. I am the Alpha uh, and Omega and first and last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. There, so these seven churches are real uh, local churches in different locations in the known world. Uh, but they are also representative of the history of the church uh, from the apostles to now. But is the local church really important or relevant for today, especially in America? The word church is a generic uh, word uh, with little or no meaning. Uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is much like the word B-U-T, uh, as in everything is great now, but uh, tomorrow may bring disaster. So B-U-T is a nondescript word that only moves you out of the next part of the sentence. We have uh, all sorts of organizations, uh, uh, religious and not, uh, that call themselves churches. Got the Catholic Lutheran Church, Presbyterian Church, uh, Episcopal Church, the Assembly Church. You got uh, the Baptist Church, uh, and you can go all the way down through the line to the Satanic Church. So the word church really has little or no meaning uh, to it in the to the general public, or a lot of times even to Christians. Uh, all these churches have different uh, doctrines different beliefs, and different practices. How does one know which one is right? Is the local church, as I said before, is it important and is it relevant in church in, in uh, Christian circles today? Even true Christians oftentimes have a come or go uh, attitude towards the local church. Uh, everyone uh, has a Bible so they can sit at home and read the scriptures. 
uh, and we have an open door to God's uh, throne uh, so we can sit at home and pray. Uh, we have fellowship uh, with co-workers or family or neighbors, so we really don't need uh, the fellowship uh, with like-minded uh, believers at the local church. And money is always tight. Uh, so I can't afford to give to the church, and you can go so on and, and so forth. And I ask the question again, is the local New Testament church relevant for today in America? It makes one wonder if we are indeed the last stages of the church called the Laodicean period where they're rich. And uh, they just don't care about spiritual things any longer. And I'm talking about the church. Uh, if I, dear, so the question arises, if I don't get baptized, nor join the church, nor tied to support uh, God's work, uh, nor am faithful to its services, nor involve myself in a ministry within the church, uh, uh, is the founder all right with my decision? It's sort of interesting Take a look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, if you would, please. And notes here, nevertheless, I have someone against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. They did. Somehow, God became less important to them, or Christ became less important to them. Uh, it could have been that uh, Christ became a habit, not a life. Or Christ uh, became an old friend, not our Lord. Uh, they uh, became used to Christ. They were no longer amazed. Or uh, life just overcame love. And they left their first love. And I believe that Christians, uh, true born-again believers today, God would repeat this verse to most of us. You've left your first love. So we find, is the church relevant? Is it important today in America? So why do we continue to pour uh, time, money, prayer, work, and or uh, love into this thing called the local New Testament church? I believe there are some reasons here we can look at. Go back with me uh, to Matthew chapter 16, please. Uh, Matthew chapter 16 here. Matthew 16, and let's pick up at verse 13, if you would, please. Matthew 16, 13, uh, when Jesus came into the coast of uh, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now here we see, uh, Peter, with a divine answer to Christ's question, uh, and he notes here, uh, thou art the Christ. Uh, Christ is a title. It means Messiah. In other words, Peter was saying, thou art the Messiah here. And, and again, Christ is, uh, the King James Bible is true. It's right here. It is the Christ. Uh, he's the son of the living God. So the best Peter could do at this point, uh, we find after the resurrection, Jesus is called God in Revelation, uh, excuse me, in John chapter 20. Uh, uh, now, there are all sorts of theories as to when the church began. Could have been, some believe it was with the calling of the disciples at first. Uh, some uh, believe it was Peter's confession right here. Uh, some note that it was with a resurrection and Jesus meeting the disciples in the upper room. Uh, some notes 
than it was with Pentecost, the empowering of the church of the Holy Spirit. Uh, some go and say, no, it didn't start until Paul uh, came out of the scene and it began the church to, to multiply and to grow. Uh, but we can agree on here is the founder, the foundation, the cornerstone of the new or to be new local New Testament church right here. Jesus said here, he says, he says, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, not Peter, but the confession of Peter, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Here, that uh, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter believed that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh, the Messiah. And on that foundation, the founder builds uh, his church here. Uh, we find that in Matthew chapter 18, go there with me real quick, one uh, page over or so, about 8, 15, 17 is the groundwork uh, of the church discipline. Uh, we find here in 15, uh, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. This is a world of difference from people in the church coming to the pastor and saying, Pastor, uh, uh, you need to take care of this problem. Or they go to the deacons, and the deacon comes to the pastor. And the pastor said, who said that? Now, oh, no, I can't tell you. Uh, well, then you go take care of the problem because I'm not involved in it yet. That's not biblical. Here's biblical right here. If he will not hear thee, then take uh, with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. If he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. I uh, so find here the church discipline is laid out here, the course for it. Find it Matthew chapter 28, if you would, please. Matthew 28, we find here uh, the purpose of the New Testament church. Matthew 28, uh, let's pick up in verse 18 here. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So here we find uh, the command or the commission of the church right here. I believe it's a commission of the church that uh, we teach all nations uh, about Jesus Christ. And we teach them that Jesus Christ died for their sins. And if they believe on him, he'll, he'll forgive their sins and give me eternal life. We're to baptize them so they identify with the, uh, with the Lord that they count as their Savior here. And uh, in, uh, in the name of the Son, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And then we're to teach them to observe all things in the Scriptures here from cover to cover. Uh, again, now I heard people say uh, that this dispensation changed at Pentecost. And the mission of the church changed to, quote, we are to be ambassadors for Christ. Uh, that Matthew 28 is only for the disciples. But that would be like saying uh, that God told, and if I could use the example here, that God told Dr. Cederholm or Dr. Les Olala uh, to start a college and gave them a list of goals within that college. Now, be kind, compassionate, loving to the students, teach them the scriptures, teach them Hebrew, Greek, and et cetera, et cetera. They have a list uh, to do. So when these two men die, the college no longer has these goals because God gave them to these men only. That's not how it works. Uh, the, college, uh, the, the college are to continue or to carry on what God has dictated to their founders or what their founders dictated uh, along to the college. Go with me, if you will, uh, continue to Acts. Uh, Acts uh, chapter 2 here. Acts chapter 2 concerning uh, the early church here, what I believe is the early church empowered of the Holy Spirit. 
and uh, we find the disciples, Peter's preaching here. Uh, it's f- sort of funny, Peter, who denied the Lord thrice because he was he was uh, uh, afraid. Now he stands up in public. At least 3,000 people were there, and he begins to preach Jesus Christ, and 3,000 get saved. And all of a sudden, Peter's got a backbone. So we find here in Acts chapter 2, verse 41 through 47, let's pick up in 41. Now, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Uh, so people were saved. Uh, that's part of the local church. Uh, they were baptized, and they were added to the church. Uh, now, <clears throat> I looked up this word added, it really is it isn't too defined uh, where I can stand up here and say, all right, uh, they had a list of people right here, 120 that were members of the first church and the 3,000 got saved. They wrote, got baptized. They all joined the church. And we wrote down their uh, their numbers here, but nevertheless, they were added to the church. There was some type of form or, or mission or goal or uh, some type of program where they were counted as part of the church. Uh, on this. Uh, So they were baptized. They were added to the church. Verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. Noted they continued steadfastly. They were faithful to when the church met there. Now this church met daily. (laughs) That'd be a great thing. Uh, But again, uh, we don't meet daily, but when the church is open, when the doors are open, the people or the assembly is meeting, uh, then people out to be there, they, uh, if at all possible. Uh, they continue steadfastly uh, on the apostles' doctrine, and the doctrine that we have is out of the scriptures, out of the holy word of God. It's not ordained by man. It's not by some book, by some famous author down the line. Uh, I've heard of preachers that stand up and preach uh, uh, John Piper or or, uh, MacArthur. And and, uh, I don't know if there's anything wrong with them or not. But I'm going to preach out of the Bible, the Word of God. And that's where it is. That's where our doctrine is. Uh, I know of a young man. Uh, that just he sort of stays confused a little bit because he's he's listening to all these preachers uh, on uh, as he as he drives, and what he ought to be focusing on is not those preachers. He ought to be reading the Word of God, and that's where he gets it from. Uh, here, so we find again the doctrine uh, here, uh, the teaching, the fellowship, and the breaking in bread and in prayers. They they prayed together. Uh, they ate together here. Uh, we find in verse uh, 44, if you would, uh, and they all uh, believed uh, to uh, were together and had all things common. There, it was unified. The church was unified. I think one of the saddest things I heard about, and I know it takes place all the time, but uh, still, it, it wasn't my flavor of a church or whatever, but it's still a sad thing to the community to watch a church that splits. We find that a number of people left the church, went out and started a new one instead of resolving the problems and going on for the Lord Jesus. And to me, that's that's sad. Uh, we ought to be unified. They had all, all things in common. Uh, what's mine is, <laughs> what's mine is yours, and what's yours is mine, my wife always says. Uh, what's mine is hers, and what's hers is hers. Uh, but again, uh, they had all things in common um, uh, here. Uh, 46, we find, and they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And yeah, they met in houses. I don't know how they ever got 3,120 people in a house. Uh, maybe the temple, maybe they split up, maybe uh, they were meeting outside, whatever it was. Uh, but they met together uh, every day here. Uh, 47, they continued daily. Uh, Verse 47, uh, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So people were getting saved. People were witnessing. The, ch- the church had a, uh, the assembly. The group of people had, had uh, a testimony that brought people in. Uh, a lot of churches today that are trying to bring in 
of those that care nothing for the church and and uh, through uh, some form of uh, music or drama or whatever it is. And if it works and people get saved, uh, I I don't know about that. But uh, but again, uh, there is nothing in the church that the lost desire or look for it even common. But the church had a testimony here. We said the Lord added the church, but they were praising God. You know, uh, the sad thing is, as pastor, sometimes I stop and I say, okay, uh, how about a testimony? Uh, somebody, did God do anything in somebody's life this week? And I about have to drag it out of somebody. And somebody will finally stand up and say, well, God saved my soul. Well, bless God, that's great. But has God done anything in your life this week? Is there anything that you were moved to do uh, that was sort of fun, uh, whatever, uh, on this? So you find here, again, uh, that uh, the, the church uh, comprised of saved, baptized, and members uh, of a church. Look at me, if you will, concerning the body of Christ. Uh, let's go to Romans chapter 12. Romans uh, uh, chapter 12 here, if you would. Romans chapter 12, uh, I'm trying to, uh, the founder is still wants to be present in the local New Testament church, the ones that keep his doctrines, his commands, uh, that have an uh, evangelistic attitude, uh, that try to love God and praise him, and etc. We find here in verse 5, uh, so we being many are one body in Christ and everyone members of another. The local New Testament church or assembly here, and it's not a building, it's a group of people gathered together, you well know that, but these are in Christ. It is Christ's body. Is it important? Well, let me ask you something. Is Christ important? Uh, uh, if you don't support the church and don't go to it and things like that, are you really supporting Christ and his work? No, you're not. I say, find your uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would, please. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and uh, 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 verse, uh, uh, I think it's 27, 1 Corinthians chapter 27. Uh, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. There's the word members. Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's like an arm or a leg uh, uh, here, but the arm and leg is joined to the body. And on this, so we are members in particular. We find in Ephesians uh, chapter one, if you would, uh, and I'm skipping some here. Uh, Ephesians chapter one. One could go to Colossians chapter one or Colossians chapter two, 124, 219, concerning the body of Christ, but Ephesians one, uh, 22 and 23, and he hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So if you have a, a quote unquote come and go attitude towards the church, then you have a come and go attitude towards Jesus Christ in your life. It's just that simple. We find here again, and I know it. I know here we have the body of Christ. We have the love of Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, if you would, please. Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verse 25. Let's pick up there. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives. Now, that's a good thing out to do. Uh, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Boy, that's quite a command. You ought to love your, uh, your wives as much as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. If Christ loves the church, why shouldn't we? Aren't we admonished to love what Christ loves? I find here uh, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And people say, oh, pastor, they're talking about the universal church here. It's comprised of all the saved, dead and alive, and then are going to be saved. And it's comprised of all of them. And, and, but the universal church never did anything on earth. It is the local New Testament church that does something. 
And this is what Christ is talking about right here, may, that he may present it himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or anything, but that it should be holy without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished it and cherished it, even as the Lord the church. If God loves the church that much, or Christ loves the church that much, shouldn't we love it that much? Uh, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I, uh, I speak concerning Christ and the church. We find that Christ loves the local New Testament church uh, that is uh, that is. In his doctrine, his word, it's a church that honors and glorifies him. And shouldn't we love it? Shouldn't it be something in our life that, that it becomes so important to us to demonstrate our love for what Christ loved? There's letters directed to the churches. Uh, oh, you can go first, second Corinthians, Romans. Uh, Galatians, uh, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, and on uh, are directed to the local New Testament churches, either to correct problems or to encourage them or whatever here. Now, the definition of the church, a church is a group of people that are called out by God. They trust or they are believers, baptized with a common purpose to glorify God and follow his commands. If I am going to glorify God in my life, the church has to be important. The purpose of the church includes, uh, the Bible is a center focus right here. Not the words of man, not the descriptions of man, not the interpretations of man, not the books of men, uh, whatever it is, uh, it's not some hierarchical leader in the church that, that says, well, Scripture means this or this, or we're going to change this. It's the Word of God. Uh, we find that the gospel is preached, the true gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that Jesus Christ died, was buried, rose again, and that he's coming again. The true gospel message, not that you're saved through a church or an act of the church, or a priest or a minister or a pastor that forgives your sins, whatever it else, it's a true gospel that Jesus Christ, as he said in John uh, chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then the assembly is encouraged to leave the world behind. We can't come out of the world totally, but we can leave that which taints us behind. The purpose of the church includes, and i got to hurry here, to love God, to glorify God, to display God's grace, to evangelize the world, to baptize believers, to teach believers, to edify believers, to discipline believers, to provide fellowship for believers, to care for its own in a time of need, to act as a restraining and enlightening force in the present world, and to promote all that is good. The truth of the matter is, we are looking to make a move and to possibly purchase a building. But I think before we need that, before we are able to even uh, do that, we need to examine ourselves and say, am I really committed to the local New Testament church, the Calvary Baptist Fellowship. Am I really that committed? The unfortunate thing is a group that just split here in Sturgeon Bay, they had a nice building. I don't know what their services are like or, or what they preach or teach, and, and I'm not being disparaging on that, uh, but a group left them. Now, the group they left behind is smaller. Are they going to be able to afford the utilities? And if they got a mortgage, are they going to be able to afford that? And we find here they the one group was not committed to, wait a minute, let's resolve problems. 
Let's get things taken care of. Now let's do whatever needs to be done and we'll work together. Now offenses are going to come. Whether they come from me or from somebody else, offenses are going to come. And if you're committed, you're not going to get in a huff and stomp off and not come to church anymore. Uh, you're going to be determined either, number one, just to forgive the offense and to go on for the Lord. Or number two, uh, come and tell the offender, wait a minute, you offended me. I think you're wrong here. Uh, let's work together and resolve this problem and, and go on for the Lord. That's the commitment we need. Are you committed? Are you committed to give? Are you committed to work in the church? Are you committed to uh, to whatever is necessary, to ministry or whatever? Are people committed uh, to uh, being part of the local New Testament church here that we call Calvary Baptist Fellowship? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Pray that you guide and direct us and help us, Heavenly Father, that Christ might be lifted up and glorified. We love you. <clears throat> we thank you for all things. Pray that you just direct our footsteps and help us. Father, give us real wisdom on this next step that we're looking to do, whether we should or whether we shouldn't. <clears throat> Father, I pray that you guide there. I pray that, Father, people might, Lord, uh, see a commitment to uh, the local New Testament church that Christ loves. That's his body. And that they'd be willing, uh, Lord, to follow the Lord in believers' baptism, that they would be willing to join, that they would be willing to a tithe uh, to support the church, that they'd be willing to work in a ministry, that they'd be willing uh, to do whatever's necessary to see the church go forward. Please help us, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Uh, amen.